So the special issue is about atmospheric effects of solar eclipses. And this largely came out of the eclipse last year, the 20th of March 2015, which uh, traversed across the UK, amongst other places. And I found that there was a great deal of work going on. We did some citizen science activity, and we also made some measurements and did our own experiments here on this campus, in fact, at this particular site. And uh, there were other measurements made. Um, the Met Office made a lot of measurements. And also some special weather forecasts were made for the eclipse day itself. And so it seemed to make a lot of sense to bring together all that science in one place. So when you have a solar eclipse, it's like you've turned off the energy that's driving the atmosphere. But you do that very quickly and you know exactly when it's going to happen and you know exactly how long it's going to last. And astronomical calculations allow us to work that out very precisely. So that means that during the day, when there is an eclipse, you know that the radiation coming in, the, that's driving, the driving energy of the atmosphere is, is going to be cut off and you can look for the responses. You can see what the temperature change will be, whether the winds change, changes in the upper atmosphere, changes throughout the atmosphere. So we've got a definite event and we look for the response. And so that gives us something very close to a natural experiment with the atmosphere. So as an experiment on the atmosphere, because you know what's going to happen and you observe what does happen, then you're um, able to test things like weather forecast models and improve them and see how well they predict the changes which happen around an eclipse. Another use of eclipse science is that with more and more renewable energy and using wind turbines and solar power, then the effect, although it's brief, on those energy systems is important to evaluate. And in the 2015 eclipse, our observations and our advice allowed the national grid to plan their electricity differently to allow for the fact that wind generation would also be reduced as a result of the eclipse as well as fairly obviously the um, solar generation of energy. So one of the things that we did at Reading before uh, the eclipse was we realised that people would be interested and we could use this as an outreach tool for science outreach. So we set up something which we called the National Eclipse Weather Experiment, which was very brave because we didn't know whether we were going to get many people um, taking part. But as it turned out, we had about 500 participants all the way from Cornwall to Shetland. So it was genuinely national. And what we did was set up a web form where people could make measurements of temperature and wind and cloud during the eclipse, enter it into the web form, and the deal was that we promised to analyse it very quickly and to get the results back to them the same day, which is exactly what we did. So we tested and trialled the web forms and we made sure they worked well and tested our software. And the results were published in a national newspaper at about four o'clock in the afternoon and the eclipse was um, in the morning. So we did keep our promise on that. And we found that the observations recorded through the NUEX, the National Eclipse Weather Experiment, really mapped very closely onto the professional measurement networks that were also running at the same time. For example, the Met Office and other sources of measurements up and down the country. So as a scientist, I looked at the 1999 eclipse. And one of the problems was I didn't get very much data. And there were measurements made about hourly. And I wanted to get measurements that perhaps came in every minute or every few minutes or more rapidly than that. And this was really the first eclipse of the social media era in the UK. So it, we had the means to get it in. And that's actually exactly what happened. Where I was not so happy was that our level of engagement with different groups across the country was rather more within people who, in terms of higher education, were familiar with the higher education sector. And, of course, you will want a much more diverse audience, if you could. But we did an analysis of that. One of the papers does look at how effective this was as an activity in reaching in to different audiences. So, at the time of the eclipse, we held some events here in Reading. Um, on the morning of the eclipse for um, school children and the evening before for adults and we had several talks at that and one of the talks was given by Ian Blatchford who's the director of the Science Museum and he has a very keen interest in art and he gave an excellent talk on how uh, eclipses have been depicted in art um, across a long time. 
And what I saw from that, of course, was just how that's another way of reaching people, that there are plenty of people who understand um, different ways of, uh, of, of looking at natural events, and eclipses in art really offered that. But also, it would be dishonest not to say that eclipses aren't exciting and people like them and find them fascinating things. So the idea that there are other human responses um, to eclipses seemed entirely appropriate to include. And Phil Trans, again, as a general science journal, seemed like the right place for interdisciplinary works like that. Well, I think it's probably improved measurement networks. So there are many new technologies for making measurements. For example, we, we use some balloon experiments here, and we use the balloons to keep our sensors above any cloud. There was cloud at the time of the eclipse um, in, southern, in the southern UK. But using balloons, we made measurements above the clouds. Well, with unmanned aircraft and those sorts of technologies, then I suspect many more sensors could be kept aloft during an eclipse. And so we would get better coverage. But also measurement networks in general are expanding. So I think there are many more opportunities with new eclipses to make more measurements with more detail at higher resolution. And ultimately, these are to test weather forecasting models. And so when we've got better information, then our ability to improve weather forecasts from these observations are just as improved massively.